I was just going to mention, I'm like, if you find yourself wanting to purchase this before consulting a derm, I would say, please don't, don't do let, it. Let us be that voice of reason to not do that. Yep. Welcome back, everyone. This is the Chemist Confessions Podcast. I'm Gloria. I'm Victoria. This is a human conversation on all the skincare science we talk about on the daily. And today we are going to talk about urea. Mm. I feel like this is a very unassuming ingredient that's mm. like randomly creeping up the rankings on everyone's radar. And yeah, in a very unassu- unassuming way. <laughs> yeah, I so we decided to do an episode on urea because I actually polled our followers on Instagram on um, what other hydrating or... um. I don't know, just barrier supporting ingredients mm-hmm. we should talk about. I put urea on the list, but I really didn't expect it to win. But something like half of you guys voted for it. I would say urea would not have been on my 2024 ingredient bingo card right? that we would be talking about this yeah. year. Yeah. yeah, it's an old guy that's been around for a long time. And today, the big question of the episode is, in addition to being a hydrator, that's what we're talking about here, is that it's also known as a keratolytic agent or it kind of sloughs off dead cells. So we did get a lot of people asking, wait, so does that mean it can replace my AJs? I guess they want to go more minimalistic. Yeah, like simple, more bang gentle. For buck. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, yeah, I get it. I think that's a great question that we can hopefully address. Answer. Yes. <laughs> um, yeah, but we have to start with what is urea? Yes, uh, we also get this a lot. Let's get this out the way. <laughs> it is one of the metabolites in your excretory system. Yes. You do contain urea in your urine. <laughs> um, but it's also just a very common compound in nature. In fact, it's a natural part of your skin. It's part of your NM- N- NMF system. So it's. Um, I have a little chart here that I found in a review paper. Your NMFs are a collective of ingredients or I guess molecules that reside in the deep layers of your skin to kind of draw water, and it's your skin's natural water grabbing system. Um, yeah, exactly. Think of, think of like that. Exactly. So you have your free amino acids, your PCAs, your lactase, your sugars, and urea is actually a pretty significant part of it. So naturally, your skin contains about seven percent ish of yep, urea for sure. Um, now, the cool thing about urea that we had briefly hinted at is that urea, similar to lactic acid. At different concentrations, you collect different benefits. Yeah, exactly. Um, this paper broke it down really well. Generally speaking, you'll find it at 2 to 10%, mm. and it's considered hydrating at that level. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's a medium dose between 10 to 30%. It's hydrating. It can be keratolytic. That's when you get that exfoliation benefit. And it's also considered a topical drug enhancer. It's actually been used to... Uh, alongside, say, your hydrocortisone to help with delivery. Uh, and then lastly, there's the ultra high level, the 30 to 50% urea. It can be, it's used for a lot, a lot of different conditions, right? They've looked at it from anything from dermatitis, psoriasis, to even dandruff and nail stuff. A lot of, yeah, it's it's wild. Whoa, what kind of nail stuff are we talking? Oh, I don't know if I want to see it. Okay. <laughs> yeah, so it makes those hoof removing. Yeah, like, oh no. <laughs> the urea actually has a really wide range of application. Above all else, you'll most likely find it in the 2 to 10% in your body moisturizers. And I will say a lot of people, it because urea is a little buzzy, it feels a little new. But it's actually been around for forever. I found this great summary table yeah. of all the hydration studies urea has uh, has been in for just even healthy subjects. It ranges from like 1982 to 2011. <laughs> and they use it between anywhere between 2 to 10%. And at all of these levels, it is it is moisturizing. Yep. Um, I do love that urea has been, has been benched time and time again yeah. against placebos to show that it can effectively increase your hydration level and decrease tool. I also... Just wish that there was a summary table for every ingredient we looked at because at this point it's like, bam, here's the table. Yeah. There you go. (laughs) Hydrating. My job is done. Thank you so much. (laughs) Yeah. Um, And some of them do have, I see a couple uh, actual comparisons. Like they wanted to compare 5% urea to 5% canola oil what? feels like a very random i know apples I'm like, to like durian like comparison this <laughs> opportunity for something else mm-hmm. but yeah um and i think the other thing to just keep in mind is just general protocol um you're looking at using it twice a day um and it looks like for most of these studies they're using it for around on average two weeks 
Yeah, yeah, exactly. So that's basically what urea is in a nutshell. Mm. And we'll take a quick break before we dive into your question. Hum. So is urea better than glycerin and better than my glycolic acid? <laughs> Our chemist confessions better oil was formulated with all skin types in mind. We searched high and low for our favorite omega-3, omega-6 heavy oils to create an oil that is friendly for all skin types. Along the way, we really ran into some funky stuff. We're talking aged broccoli spelling oils. But finally, we settled on our trio of sea buckthorn seed, black currant, and rosehip oil to create the better oil. This trio creates a base with a signature golden color and a rich velvety texture that sinks into skin without leaving it greasy. Do you hear that, oily skin people? But wait, there's more. Instant hydration was only half of it. We added potent soothers like Bisabola and Boswellia serrata and free fatty acids to help you take care of your skin barrier for the long haul. Podcast listeners, please don't forget to use code CCPODCAST2024 to get 15% off your first order. Check it out. Pew, 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 pew. <laughs> All, All right. right. Okay, guys, strap in, strap in. Oh, this, I'm tired. I know, this I'm is going to be a little rough, I'm not going to lie. <laughs> Urea is really well studied, yeah. but the data is a little rough. Let's just say Laura spent a lot of time. It's like the better half of a day. <laughs> I think I, I, I was, I had, I, I started my day with a list of to-do lists. And this is something that had a time limit on it. So I was like, I will start here. And here's like all the other stuff I'll do after I'm done doing my Euro research. I did not get to the other things on my list. I think what's even more painful is combing through all of those studies and finding so many of them not relevant. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So in the previous episode about glycerin, yeah. we already copied that. We, uh, we, already, <laughs> we already covered a couple studies where glycerin was benched against urea. And we find that urea seems to be mm. on par with glycerin in terms of instant hydration, yeah. but can be better in terms of decreasing your transepidermal water loss. So it's implied that it might be more multifunctional than glycerin for barrier stuff. But because it's also keratolytic, we get actually quite a few questions from our poll. Like Khan asks, how does it compare to say PHAs or low percentage AHAs? Sure. And the mic since the mic asks, since it can be exfoliating, is it gentle enough around the eyes? How does it compare to exfoliating acids? All great questions. All great questions that's really hard to answer. I would love to pull up a paper and say, ah, oh, blah, 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 in Sweden did a study that Ben took 10% urea against 10% glycolic acid. Here's the findings. That don't exist. So <laughs> we're going to go through some of the studies that they have done on this and kind of infer yeah. uh, what we can there. Yeah. All right. First off, it, urea is often, and I should mention that uh, urea has been studied a ton. A lot of it is done on you know, skin conditions, various mm -hmm. skin conditions, anything yeah. from psoriasis to atheosis. So none of these uh, comparative studies can be found on just plain old normal skin or just dry skin. A big chunk of the studies are done on atheosis vulgaris. And this is a skin condition that you're born with where you basically, your skin really wants to hold on to that excess dead cells. Yeah. And as you can imagine, um, part of the proposed therapy here is things that will help it shed. So... One of the studies um, we found, it was a 10% urea lotion was benched against a 5% lactic acid lotion. Interesting. Dang it, not one-to-one. -one. Nope, not one-to-one. -one. And in that study, they did find that the urea side had greater improvement with test agents based on the global severity scale. And I think this is great because it goes beyond the hydration level and tool. We are talking about um, the quality of skin, the appearance of scaliness mm -hmm. and roughness, all of that combined. And this basically concludes our one-to-one <laughs> -one studies that I can find. <laughs> There's some other yeah. ones, like it also outperform a 2% acid cream, which is cool. Yeah, I, I definitely feel the pain. And I have to mention, some of these are looking at things like 0.1% retinoic acid. Mm -hmm. And like Laura just mentioned, the 2% cell acid in paraffin. Mm -hmm. um, well, they did see that the urea cream had some uh, benefits that were greater than this. This is all based on subjects with an actual skin condition. Yeah. So even sharing this, it's like the relevance to people who just want to know if, I don't know, with normal skin that want to maybe use it instead of their gold standard or the ordinary 7% glycolic acid. I don't know if that can actually really translate. We just know exactly. that it's keratolytic. Yeah, yeah. So like... That's such a good point and something that <laughs> we mentioned a few times when we talk about lactic acid, like Victoria mentioned earlier, is that it's lactic acid is actually very similar to urea in that it is also part of your skin's NMF system. Yeah. At low levels, it's hydrating. And then at higher levels, it's used basically like an exfoliator. It can even be used as a peel. 
five percent is very much in that super gentle exfoliation yes. and more hydration, more realm. hydrating than exfoliating. So the ten percent to five percent comparison, I'm like, <laughs> cool. Wish you did ten percent. <laughs> yeah, like something a little <laughs> bit more, or at least one on one. Yeah. So yeah. And I was just going to mention all of these studies that are shared here are tested at 10%. So mm -hmm. this seems to be the general standard, standard mm -hmm. um, especially for that keratolytic aspect. Yes. Yeah. Okay. And I did want to share one more paper where we can maybe extract a little bit more insight from. Yeah. This is for a much more stubborn condition, seborrheic keratosis. And that's when skin has, it's it's not all over the place like uh, the vulgaris, which is ethiosis vulgaris. This is when maybe you have like a patch of scaly like a skin. Lesion. Yes, and it becomes thick and sometimes it comes with hyperpigmentation mm -hmm. as well. Um, treatments include, you know, like very serious peels to like basically get it off skin. And <laughs> in this For time, listeners, Gloria just used a scalpel wrenching, <laughs> like digging deep motion yeah. for you. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Urea is used at very high levels here to treat it. Yeah. Um, this I should mention this particular study wasn't a comparative study, but it looked at a combination of 42, weirdly specific, 42% <laughs> urea, 6% lactic acid, 5% mandelic acid, and cell 2% salicylic acid. That was a... Uh, yeah. I job. mean, also just thinking that 5% mandelic acid is just hanging out there. <laughs> like, I'm not sure why no. that's there. <laughs> yeah. So this is the throw every... Yeah exfoliant at the wall kind of approach mm -hmm. and you can see i'll put some before and after pictures up you'll see that the results are pretty astounding it did mm. work really well and i think for me my takeaway here is that um first of all urea 42 percent is very high it um in the paper it says no adverse effects were observed so it's considered pretty gentle it can be used alongside a good amount of AHA, so we mm. would say a total amount of AHA, BHA of like 13% is not insignificant as mm. a leave on. That's a good point. So it doesn't seem like those these acids are essentially competing with urea and then leaving skin really, really over exfoliated. So, it, so for me, that's like kind of the extraction I would take from this paper. All this, this is going to be a shorter episode because it's very hard <laughs> to draw conclusions from these like sidestepping yeah, we're really studies. trying to read between the lines here yeah. really really yeah so generally speaking um, as a hydrator urea is great it's very well studied there's a ton on it anywhere from two to ten percent mm -hmm. it could be better than even glycerin which is a very well studied very mm -hmm. well done hydrator especially if you have really dry skin or even compromised skin barrier it doesn't have to go to a degree of you have to go to your derm but let's just say if you suffer like chronic dry skin like xerosis this can be a great addition to your routine yeah but like our last episode in glycerin uh humectants nmfs they're all better used as a group mm -hmm. so yes if you get urea at a good percentage great um but you know i think the general strategy as always is to try to get more of different kinds yeah, yeah. and the question of is it better or how does it compare to HAs and PHAs? <laughs> it's not going to be a straightforward one because no. there isn't a direct comparison. Yeah. So the good thing is based on um, not just the one I highlighted, but a couple of combination therapy papers that mm -hmm. we were able to find. It highlights that urea doesn't seem to be irritating at all, even yeah. at the keratolytic care level at 10 to 20 percent. It seems pretty well tolerated. And people with these skin conditions, they can experience a lot of irritations on top of what they're going through. Yeah. That's which a good point. might explain why it's not benched against something more aggressive like glycolic acid mm. as much. So, um, no, oh, that's a great point, actually. That's a great theory. I like that. Uh -huh. Yeah. So, if you are already using glycolic acid and let's say you want to get try out a cream with urea and you worry about over exfoliation, I wouldn't worry at all. Yeah. Um, I wouldn't use urea to replace, replace it yeah. at all. Yeah. But if you absolutely cannot tolerate AHAs, at all and your skin just overly sensitized urea seems like a very gentle mm -hmm. alternative approach to keeping skin turnover healthy yeah and i think one thing to also keep in mind is as gloria was saying um urea for very dry skin is great um but people with compromised skin um that do experience irritation just know that with any new ingredient even urea still patched us you know yeah. it is still possible to experience irritation um so like with anything new and if you're going to give this a try, just patch test. So just one reminder on that. Cool. So that's it. Thanks, Gloria. <laughs> Thanks for all your labor. Oh, okay. Yeah. I, you know, I, I have to say it's, I, I think most people know us from watching the episodes is 
we are definitely not quick to come to conclusions. Yeah. And we definitely cannot make a conclusion here yeah. because there is very little that's relevant to actual cosmetic skincare. Yeah. A lot of this is skin conditions and that is a very different scenario. So that's just the general state of things. And that's yeah. just how it is. It's life. Yep. And we will take a quick break, yeah. but after the break, we'll, we'll go into a little bit on how to shop for Yubia and how to add it to your routine. Let's do it. <laughs> Are you lost on how to build an effective skincare routine that targets your skin concerns? Check out our skincare recipes for inspiration. Head to chemistconfessions.com, routine builder, skincare recipes. That is where you'll find our handy skincare starter pack for anything from very, very dry skin to hyperpigmentation strategies. Check out the recipes to help you get started and don't forget to stay consistent. Gotcha. 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 <laughs> All right. Okay, guys. I'm not going to sugarcoat it. Shopping for urea seems really wild. You know, I thought peels were bad. Um, but man, Amazon just never fails to disappoint. I think. Yes. Yeah. So um, I will say a lot of studies we mentioned in this uh, in this episode, a lot of it's done on body. Mm-hmm. And urea is urea is a very economical ingredient. Yes. Um, so that's also why you'll see it in a lot of body lotions. But if you go to, say, something like Amazon and you just Google urea lotion you see a lot of kind of questionable stuff (laughs) yeah i think gloria found that in the first few choices that are pushed to you um you get a normal urea product and then you get three 40 percent urea creams and we can tell you 40 percent is not a normal amount we just shared the percentage with you uh in the previous segments and if you can recall 40 percent is when they're actually trying to aggressively treat disorders so this is kind of terrifying yeah so i would say definitely stay clear of that if you have say psoriasis or um keratosis like anything that requires that may need the help of a 40 percent urea cream consult your germ yes you know they can guide you to a more reputable version of these ultra high level creams yes um i can't really say what's in these 40 (laughs) percent creams but i would be a little concerned um i was just gonna mention i'm like if you find yourself wanting to purchase this before consulting a derm i would say please don't do it let us be that voice of reason to not do that yeah um i did want to say that if you want to try it out and urea again we talk a lot about mostly face skincare yeah but if you have really dry body um, I definitely would recommend starting with the user in 10%. Yeah. Because they did a study. They did a very specific study on yeah. this product. And I will say finding a clinical on a body product is very difficult. Yeah. Um, but yeah, Userin, they wanted to test their, I believe it's their roughness relief body mm-hmm. lotion. Um, they used 10% urea. They actually tested it on 60 subjects, which is awesome. And the average age being 64. Yeah. And these, yeah, and these people have healthy skin just dry yes um and they tested for four weeks compared to a placebo on the forearm yeah they use it twice daily and over the four weeks they observed the subjects every day every week and it showed that um it did outperform the lotion base significantly in Mm -hmm. terms of hydration level and what i find really interesting is how they measure is they get the subjects to come back in and they will apply their morning sesh there and then they measure skin hydration levels um three hours after and 12 hours after yeah Remember how we mentioned they keep you in jail for hydration <laughs> studies? They kept them there for 12 hours. I hope they got fed. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. But I think that's a great point because um, some people, especially those with very dry skin, skin can get very uncomfortable. So you want to understand what skin's going to, what's going on with skin at the three hour mark mm-hmm. and also half a day mark mm-hmm. so that you know um, how is your lotion, does your lotion have your back? at half a day yes yes <laughs> yeah so yeah no i think that's great and i i do think eastern the 10 percent urea is a classic mm-hmm. um it feels like the classic urea cream to go to yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh i was gonna say i but i am surprised by how many more urea products that are out there now yeah cetaphil has a rough and bumpy lotion that actually has 20 percent urea mm-hmm. i am not 100 percent sure if cetaphil did a study on 20 percent mm-hmm. but 20 percent is still relatively common um I, I would say if you are oh it has sweet almond oil jesus anyway, <laughs> i will say if you are if you feel like 10 percent doesn't do it or if you feel like your skin is really dry uh, to a point where it's developing texture then 20 percent urea might be worth a try mm. and um in this department mm. um in terms of face products with urea it's a little bit more far and wide in between um yeah. we did find especially if you're looking for a percentage like 
like we mentioned, urea is very effective between two to ten percent, and most of the tests are done at at least five to ten. Um, the one of the only face lotion products we can find is the Inkyless ten percent urea. Yeah, I definitely want to spend a little time on who should be using urea. Yeah. Um, because I think just a reminder that most of these studies are done on body. And a lot of this is looking at very dry skin, like we had talked about in the previous segment. Because urea is also a keratolytic, we actually only would probably recommend this for those with, you know, generally dry, very, very dry skin. Probably the the group that um, maybe should just keep, um, I guess, the group that maybe should uh, approach this more cautiously is probably the acne individuals. Just know that, you know, as a keratolytic, it, you might actually experience just a little bit of purging as well. I just feel like because urea is seen as that hydration ingredient, yeah, that yeah. benefit that might actually to them sound as like generally helpful and soothing and irritation. And you might think this is a go to, but know that this can actually be a trigger. Yeah, for sure. Um, and that's kind of the urea landscape. And let's wrap this episode up with your questions answered. All right, let's do it. Okay, we got a series of percentage-based questions. Is 10% really too harsh for the face? Mm. The 5% doesn't seem to work on me. Does it stop being effective for psoriasis after a while? And uh, Judith Holler asks, is 10% a good percentage in moisturizers? Yeah, so like we said, 5 to 10% is great. So we, wouldn't say, we would say no, it is definitely not too harsh for a face. Um, Cyrus, you ask if it's stopped being effective for psoriasis. We would say check with your derm because that sounds like a better question for them. I don't know what other... Um, topicals you may be using. That is definitely a better question for your derm. Yep. All right. Next question. At Roxy QFS, it was prescribed for me to treat stretch marks. Does it make sense? All right, guys, we might dedicate an episode to stretch marks at one point, but <laughs> um, does it make sense? Yes. A lot well, of treatments for stretch marks is hydration and keratolytics. Yes. And cell turnover yeah. stuff. Um, so, in that sense, yes. What results should you expect? I would say tamper your expectations. <laughs> Marks is notoriously stubborn and very, very annoying. I was going to mention, I don't know if urea is the first ingredient that comes to mind when it comes to stretch marks. Uh, but then yeah. I was thinking about all the other ingredients I'd go to and be like, none of them. Yeah. It's like, I don't really know. I feel like stretch marks is that thing you just, another one where you just throw the kitchen sink at it and yeah. see what happens. Yeah. yeah. And hope it works out. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Uh, next question. At Bert Thunderstone asked, ah, uh, yes, the classic question that everyone has when you hear about urea and skincare. How do they make it not from piss? <laughs> Does it stink? <laughs> you okay. Urea is not sourced from human urine. They do not collect your urine mm -hmm. to make urea. Yeah, it's a very straightforward basic. Mm -hmm. Uh it's synthetic essentially. It's uh it's there's a lot of one established uh reactions that generate urea every high purity. It's a very simple, very economic <laughs> process. No need to bake your piss to extract the urea. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> actually, know it doesn't stink. <laughs> yeah. And it's actually a really important ingredient in fertilizer. Mm -hmm. So that's why it's also so economical. Um, and it comes from ammonia. So um, as someone asked if it stinks, there might be just a, a whiff mm -hmm. of like just that kind of a, um, organic -y smell. Kind of. Yeah. It's just a whiff. But uh, other than that, it should not stink. I feel like I definitely use stink your ingredients in urea. Your itself is like just. Maybe there's a base odor, but it's yeah. not really stinky. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Remember when we were talking about the better oil? Broccoli. Yeah. Broccoli Bro oil. Fermented broccoli. Still permanently singed in my mind. Terrible. I still can smell it. <laughs> yeah. Terrible. <laughs> All right. Finally, I think this is a comment from at Tess Horton. Mm -hmm. She asks, I glorify urea, but my face doesn't. Could ectoin be a good replacement? That is a great question. <laughs> you know what? Thank you for giving us a future episode idea. Yeah. I don't think ectoin really functions in the same realm mm -hmm. as urea. If you're looking for a good basic hydrator, you know, like I think glycerin is always a very yeah. basic ingredient to include. If you're looking for something that kind of plays in the same M NMF field as urea, actually try lower levels of say lactic acid mm. but for ecto and what does it do for your skin we will save it for yeah. a later episode also another rising ingredient that i'm not expecting yeah 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 cool well hopefully this episode was slightly helpful please tell me <laughs> it's helpful tell me my day was a burn looking at these 1986 <laughs> urea papers <laughs> yeah hopefully gloria's blood sweat and tears was not for naught um but uh otherwise 
Uh, if you have a burning question that you would like to ask us, please write to us at info at chemistconfessions.com. You can DM us your question on Instagram at chemist.confessions. Also check our Instagram out if you want to provide us a question for the next podcast episode. Um, and finally, you can just leave your question on the comments below. But otherwise, we will see you next time. Thanks, guys. Bye. Bye.